Thank you, everybody. Namaste, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you're joining us from the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Siddharth, and I'll be the host uh, for you I mean, for the lecture this evening. My, I am a part of the Climate Risk and Finance Council. And just to give you, we will structure the lecture in the, in the following manner. I'll take about two minutes to give an introduction about Climate Risk and Finance Council. Then I will introduce our speaker for the day, Ms. Jennifer Faust. Uh, we will conduct a poll of two questions just to understand where the audience is joining us and what kind of audience we have. And uh, Ms. Faust will take over most of the, um, will take over from there. Her lecture will be for maybe 30, 40 minutes. Uh, after that, we will uh, have a brief Q&A session and then we will end with the vote of thanks. So that's the brief structure of the of the lecture this evening. So allow me to please um, I welcome you all once again and to give you a brief about what Climate Risk and Finance Council is. So climate risk is or climate change is um, is a looming factor in the businesses in the short, medium term. And if we don't do it well in the long term as well. So it brings forth with us with it a multitude of risks and opportunities for businesses uh, to conduct their affairs. So it, will, it is going to, climate change is going to force societies and businesses to adapt and mitigate uh, this new creature of climate risk in their operations. It's been an ignored uh, risk, but now it's become part of our lives and it, therefore it will have its own impact on the way that businesses run, businesses function. So businesses and investors interested to managing these risks and benefiting uh, from the upcoming opportunities, uh, we'll have to manage a complex system of, uh, of, uh, of processes of disclosures of accounting and banking standards uh, that will satisfy themselves, that will satisfy the regulatory requirements. So these, these kind of processes that has to be followed can be daunting and sometimes discouraging. So that's where we believe uh, we can be of value at Climate Risk and Finance Council since, the, since we were uh, incorporated last year. So we are, are a non-profit entity, uh, a group of prof practicing risk professionals from the banking and the uh, insurance industry. So a lot of us are practitioners. A lot of us are veterans who have retired from the industry as well, um, um, who have had the opportunity to work with such cutting edge processes and standards uh, in their in their career, and the youngsters who are likely to face these kind of uh, uh, challenges or these kind of processes in their uh, in in their career henceforth uh, would are, are going to be the main beneficiaries from uh, from our uh, council here. So once the climate risk part is better understood, better monitored, and it is better managed, then we can utilize um, climate finance to help and create a more equitable and more resilient. Uh, world. So we uh, are our mission or rather what we envision to do as the council is to provide thought leadership in perceiving climate risk and its impact on the financial institutions. Uh, we aim to compile and develop resources for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And as we move forward, as we understand the climate uh, risk uh, features, to develop philosophical foundations and to develop practical tools to implement climate risk related uh, financial disclosures or risk management in the financial institutions. So to achieve these broad goals, we have a we, we have a weekend webinar that we where we introduce and uh, bring forth to you experts in the field to, to uh, give us their, to share with us briefly their insights and what they see uh, that will go forward as we deal with climate risk. So this uh, weekend we have uh, Ms. Jennifer Faust, um, our, our special speaker for this week for this weekend. So Ms. Faust is the founder of the Washington DC based Faust Global Partners. She has had over 20 plus years of experience in investment and business advisory. Uh, Faust Global Partners specializes in offering strategic advice on ESG and sustainability private equity, venture capital, impact investment, and development finance. So in a sense, she has a ringside view of how these investors and uh, uh, capitals of finance or the captains of finance are looking at ESG and sustainability. She also serves as managing director of the Bankers Without Boundaries 
a non-profit entity. It's a network of investment bankers to assist high impact projects, focusing on the environment and the social good. So Ms. Faust is also a regular expert speaker on ESG and sustainability on a variety of industry fora. So I will request uh, uh, Ms. Faust uh, to, to, I mean, I welcome Ms. Faust to our, our webinar this week. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you so much too for the warm um, introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Good day. Good night. For me here in Washington, D.C., it's at the beginning of my day, right around 10 o'clock or so. Um, I'm excited to be here, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to speak to you for the next 30 to 40 minutes or so um, about a number of topics in ESG. Um, I enjoy these opportunities to not only talk about ESG and sustainability, but I'm also looking forward to towards the end of our discussion, some questions and answers. Um, I learn uh, just as much from you as I hope that you're going to be able to, to learn from me. I prepared a presentation. So Siddharth, I'm going to share my screen if that's acceptable to you. Yes, please. Okay, and we'll start going through the slides. Um, let me get everything up here. Hold on, please. get to the beginning here of the presentation. There we go. All right. Siddharth, can you clearly see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I have min minimized, you know, um, being able to see your faces too. So please do let me know if, um, if something comes up that you're unable to see, see clearly or, or hear me at all clearly. Um, ESG investing. I mean, that's the broad topic of our discussion today. Um, and again, I'm excited to, to be here and to be able to take this time to go over these topics. We're going to cover a lot today. And so some slides I'm going to go through a little bit quicker than others, but um, we'll look forward to having some time towards the end to go through questions and answers. Again, so my name is Jennifer Faust. I'm based in the Washington, D.C. area. I am a business advisory firm focused on ESG and sustainability. Um, I've had my own firm now for about 12 years. Prior to that, um, I've spent time in the, the U.S. government. I've spent time in investment banking. Um, so I have about 20 to 25 years of experience broadly in this space. And I like to tell people, too, that I was active in the space before it was called um, ESG. Sorry, one minute there. Let me get my uh, get my dog here a second too. Hold on. Hold on. It's Saturday morning here, so it's a little busy around my house. My apologies for that. Um, the purpose of today is for us to discuss some very critical topics in ESG and sustainability. We're going to go through, as I said, a number of things, starting with uh, ESG investing and what it is versus impact investing and other types of investing. And then we're going to touch on what I think are some really critical um, topics as you begin ESG in your organization, accountability, materiality, measurement. And then we're going to end very briefly on some trends and pitfalls and next steps that I work with and clients. So in my business advisory firm, I have both public and private clients. I work with, for example, in the, the, the public space, the United Nations um, is one of my largest clients. And I work on a number of sustainability uh, programs with them. And then in, the pri my, in my private client space, I work with businesses, with executive staffs and boards, helping them to implement an ESG strategy. And so these are kind of best practices, things that I've learned 
from working with both public and private clients. And then as it are said to speaking to numerous groups and chief sustainability offices and numerous businesses around the world. So very quickly, impact investing, ESG investing, you hear so many of these terms being used interchangeably. Um, and to just talk a little bit about the difference between the two, because um, there are differences. Um, you know, impact investing really focuses on bringing a socially desirable outcome as part of the investment thesis. So there is an expectation of a financial return, but investors are directly going into the opportunity with an expressed good, do good investment. So basically it's going in first with the, the impact and the byproduct of that is going to be the financial returns. One of my favorite sayings in this, um, in this field in ESG and sustainability is what gets measured gets managed. Um, if you're familiar at all with my work in any way, you'll hear that, that said multiple times. I think it's a great, um, uh, I think it's just a, a great life, you know, uh, a quote there too. And so with impact investing and ESG investing, measurement is incredibly important. And so how you measure it and how you report it is a key aspect of how I work with clients because at the end of the day, if you don't measure it, it's not ultimately gonna end up being managed. So some other differences between in impact investing and ESG investing really too has to do with the deployment of capital. Um, it has to do with ESG investing. You're investing still into regular businesses, regular companies, um, and they, for example, here, I mentioned Apple, I mentioned Tesla. There's been numerous examples publicly um, in, uh, you know, in, in the press about Tesla this past year with respect to them actually being delisted from various ESG um, uh, you know, platforms. But it's focused on investing in companies, regular companies, but those who have decided to report on ESG factors, right? So it is just they're disclosing information about positive and negative ESG factors. They're traditional companies, um, but their goals are not necessarily specific to, to sustainable development goals or anything like that too. So the goal is you're gonna be reporting on ESG factors. You hope that they will place some pressure and hold them accountable. But at the same time, it's not necessarily an express goal. I don't know how clear it is to see this screen in particular, but um, the differences between ESG and impact investing, and certainly after this, I am more than welcome to share my slides and you'll be able then to take a little bit more time to go through. But you see on this slide here, the difference with alignment and with impact here. So again, the idea behind ESG is you're gonna start integrating non-financial factors into investment processes. You're trying to um, avoid, you know, some exposures risk, you know, um, you know, ESG, most people start ESG with a risk perspective. How do I mitigate risk? And then over time, they start working on the actual value creation of it. But um, impact, it is all about the impact. And the byproduct of it is ultimately going to be um, a financial return as well, but there needs to be demonstrated impact associated with it. So now to move in a little bit more to the section about ESG, one of the topics I often get is about accountability and who owns ESG within an organization. Um, and accountability ultimately at the end of the day is very directly related to results, right? 
this isn't, that's true about many things in life, not just simply ESG. And so I want to briefly relook at some four key actors in an organization and to kind of evaluate with you a little bit about where best ESG should lie within an organization. And so there's the board, there's the C-staff, the C-suite, your executive staff, um, an ESG team with an organization led by a chief sustainability officer or a chief um, ESG officer or the organization. You know, in we could certainly do another poll of, you know, in I, I was pleased to hear that so many of your organizations have begun implementing ESG strategies into their organization. It'd be interesting too to understand what some of these titles are. You know, as I go about my work, you know, it's fascinating how there's not a consistent term um, for, um, you know, for these names. So I see that I have a chat here. Oh, good. Yep, that's you, Siddhar. Thank you. Yep. And so, but again, accountability results, it's really one of the first topics that I address in working with clients. It's imperative that whatever strategy is put into place, it's very clear within the organization where that accountability is going to lie and who's going to own it. So the board, you know, I mean, the everything starts with the leadership within an organization, right? The directors, um, the board of directors set a corporate purpose. They set an ESG strategy. You're seeing more and more about, um, you know, the, the importance of moving ESG topics to boards. Shareholders are bringing it more. There's much more shareholder activism. I'm sure you've read about that too. Proxy seasons are seeing more and more ESG and sustainability topics being raised. And you're seeing more and more boards actually adding ESG and sustainability expertise to the board, right? The idea that the days of only having CEOs and, or I should say retired CEOs and retired CFOs sitting on boards, that the role of the board has dramatically expanded and increased and that there needs to be direct ESG sustainability experience on the boards. I think that's personally a, a really great um, advancement in boards, the diversification of the type of people that sit on a board. Then you've got the C-suite, right? The C-suite ultimately is gonna be responsible for the developing and the communicating and the executing of any ESG strategy or sustainability strategy once that priority is set by the boards. It is incredibly important that leadership infuses the ESG purpose and sustainability purpose throughout the organization and sets very concrete OKRs, right? I mentioned here something that is of um, also as of a great kind of topic today too is how does the C-suite then incentivize, you know, employees to implement ESG goals, which are traditionally more non-financial, more, you know, metrics. They're more kind of metrics that lie a little bit more in the gray area of life. And two, two ways I see people do that. One is executive compensation. Well, with... Um, I like to, Thank I like you. to nudging, right? Um, and so nudging is, um, I, I see this as being a really effective interim strategy toward ultimately then tying it directly to compensation, which is providing incentives in your organization to encourage people to, to encourage people through bonuses or, um, you know, through other types of promotion and praise in order to encourage, you know, your directors, your employees to really start adapting and adopting various e ESG sustainability goals of your organization. So next slide here, um, dedicated ESG teams, a CSO, um, you know, I also recommend very clearly to my clients that if you want to be taken seriously, um, that this is a priority for your organization is to ultimately to dedicate, you know, staffing to 
the ESG team or a chief sustainability officer, chief ESG officer, whatever type of a, uh, you know, a title is most meaningful to your particular organization. I recognize that some of the businesses that I speak with do not have the size and the scale, the budget in order to have a dedicated personnel um, devoted to ESG and sustainability. I get that. I understand that. Um, you know, I think, though, you have to ultimately then look at your organization and decide though, who's going to own it, who's going to be responsible for pushing it through. Right. And so you certainly are seeing in Europe and also in the United States more and more um, announcements that an organization has hired somebody. It's a great signal to the outside world that you're serious about this and you're really going to be implementing it throughout your organization. ESG sustainability, it, it's first of all, it, it's not a one size fits all. There's not one strategy that's going to work across every organization. There are best practices, certainly, that you can learn from. But ultimately, it needs to be adapted into your particular organization um, and also into your organizational structure. You certainly see North American and European companies prioritizing that um, and, and then having somebody that can work across the organization and focused, focused on it. And then last but not least, you have the organization, right? You know, at the end of the day, you know, you need management needs to incentivize and encourage the organization, um, especially with respect to the S of the ESG, right? You need to put together different ERGs, which are employee resource groups. Um, you really need to ultimately embed it into the purpose, the operating model and the, the structure of it. Yes, many organizations are going to need to make some changes. Um, I understand change is tough, right? But it's the only thing certain in life. Um, and smart, um, forward-looking organizations recognize the change necessary to implement sustainability, climate, and ESG ultimately into their operating um, structures, right? It's a, it's a new model of collaboration that perhaps hasn't been as in vogue in business for, for the past several years. So here are some very brief key takeaways. At the end of the day, you know, who owns ESG? Yes, it starts with strong leadership at the top of an organization, but it really ends up being everybody in the organization. So successful companies, successful organizations that have adopted sustainability and ESG, they make it a core part of their purpose. It is part of their mindset. It is part of the fabric of who they are or as, as an organization. Most organizations start sustainability and ESG with a risk mitigation perspective. I get that. The ones though that, that successfully adopt it then will actually recognize that there's long-term strategic value and they'll start building it really into who they are as an organization. So. Materiality, um, I wanna just, I, I'm doing my own time check. It's about 10.30 here. So I wanna make sure that I'm moving forward on things, but materiality. Materiality is a very key, important part of an effective ESG strategy. It's really taking a, a deep dive, a deep look into what sustainability and ESG um, uh, topics are fundamental are valuable to that particular organization. You'll hear people talk about ES to materiality assessments. Um, it is an actual assessment that businesses um, uh, do um, in order to, and, and with the support of both internal and external stakeholders. It's one of the key things that I do in my business. Um, and it really helps to draw out those key ESG issues that have a an impact on business operations and stakeholders. So there's different steps to a materiality assessment. I won't spend tons of time going through each individual ones. I'm certainly available at another time to, to do a, a deep dive. And in fact, materiality could be its own one hour discussion, if not several hours. But one thing I do want to talk about is that there's increasingly increasing discussion, in particular in Europe, about double materiality. And I just want to very 
very briefly discuss the differences between materiality and double materiality. And if you come from the accounting risk, you're familiar with the financial firm materiality, right? And now this is really bringing that concept into the ESG world. So um, double materiality, so materiality, straight materiality has to do with what type of issues are going to be material, right, to the business and to risk. So how would the environment, how does supply chain, how do those things impact your particular business? And investors, shareholders, and of course, business executives want to identify those key business risks and set up mitigation strategies accordingly. But double materiality, which is a newer concept, is the opposite direction. And it looks back and says, all right, we've looked at how the environment and climate and supply chains and all these things impact our business. We're now going to look at how our business impacts those things, right? That's the, the double side of things. So how does my business, um, you know, uh, impact society and climate change? How does my business with respect to the S and supply chains, how is it impacting, you know, um, socially with workers and worker rights and all of that? How does our governance structures impact the world around us? And it's really now this addition of double materiality, which is also driving the adoption of sustainability and ESG into to businesses. So materiality, um, double materiality, those are really some of the foundations of, of ESG. And you're seeing these assessments evolving, right, um, over time. The benefits of materiality, it, it obviously, it allows ESG, you know, um, organizations in order to identify really the true risks and opportunities and start making improvements in that. It helps you understand your impact, your social impact on society. Um, and the benefits too from uh, communications, a comms perspective, is it allows you, I think, as an organization and as a business, by identifying those core, th those core uh, uh, impacts of your business to say, this is kind of my lane that I'm going to be in. These are the things that are core to us. ESG is a enormous, sustainability is an enormous topic. Certainly, all these things are important. But as a business, this is what's important to us, and this is what we're going to focus on. And so it can also be a really important PR strategy as well. Um, and to say, we're just going to stay in our lane and focus on these core issues. Anything outside of this, we're just not going, to, right now at least, we're going to opine on. Yeah, I'm sorry. Here we go. Great. ESG, core ESG issues. I won't spend much, much time on this because it sounds like many of you are very familiar with ESG and some of the different kind of categories and indicators that fall under the E, the S, and the G. Um, there are many topics, again, very, very overwhelming, I think, for businesses and organizations. There are a few key aspects within each one of these. And I'm going to talk towards the end about um, if you're a company and organization that is new to ESG and sustainability, what do you need to think about, right? If you only do a few things um, in each of these categories, what's kind of the, the, the main topic and the, and the trend? As every anything that's big and overwhelming, I always recommend to my clients that you just you break it down into smaller manageable pieces, do a few things, do them well, and then with time grow and develop into your sustainability and ESG strategy. Some key takeaways, um, you know, it's foundational, um, double materiality, a new concept. It really double materiality is the foundation of European. ESG and sustainability regulation. I won't touch on that, but uh, Europe is all about double materiality. The United States has not been um, as motivated in that direction for lots of different reasons, but it's moving very quickly in that direction. Um, and you're starting to see with the current Biden administration, the Inflation Reduction Act and others, a movement much quicker towards this. Reporting. 
Reporting is one of the questions I get the most, right? Very, very confusing, all the different um, ESG and sustainability reporting time uh, frameworks. We're gonna briefly look a little bit into this. Um, the statistics, the reports are out there. There is great demand for ESG reporting, right? Investors, organizations, everybody wants to see a harmonization of ESG reporting. This, of course, all goes back to my earlier comment, what gets measured gets managed, and um, you're seeing increased regulation all around the world around ESG and sustainability reporting that is only going to increase. Is ESG reporting mandatory? No, not at this time, but that is changing rapidly, um, you know. The only thing certain right now with ESG reporting is, is change. Even for somebody that focuses on ESG um, and sustainability, it is really difficult even for me to keep up with all the changes. And that's also part of the reason I strongly recommend my clients that they find somebody within the organization that can be their dedicated sustainability or ESG person, because this isn't just a side job. Um, the, the, the business transformation is happening so rapidly that if you're going to stay compliant, you've got to have somebody that's keeping an eye on these, te the, these key topics. And, um, and so, you know, you're seeing more and more, it's going to be mandatory now more in Europe. It's definitely becoming more mandatory in, um, in the United States. Um, very briefly here, the kind of the common reporting frameworks that, um, that, there's greater adoption and harmonization around, of course, our GRI, the SASB. SASB now has just been, um, has recently been assimilated by um, the IFRS, right? The accounting group. My hope and, I, and my expectation is that just like you saw a coalescing around the world, into kind of two accounting standards. I know in the United States, there's GAAP and then around the world, you know, you have the international standards. You're gonna start to see, you know, uh, ESG sustainability standards starting to kind of follow suit. So I think that's a good thing. I think that's a, a very positive thing. And even as I, I encourage it, it would certainly make my life a lot easier because it's hard keeping in touch with all of these things. Um, kind of quickly talk, there's, there's a few other smaller frameworks, some too, for example, that focus a lot on um, specifically on climate um, and TCFD, for example, is one of them. You've got GHG, of course, which you're probably familiar with and stuff, but um, and in here, um, I try to give a summary um, of some of the different kind of commonly discussed and used frameworks, where they focus, and then also to their audience. Obviously, every organization, every business needs to focus on their primary, primary audience. And certainly, as I work with clients, then it's trying to adapt and adopt, then okay, this is our audience. And so this is probably the framework that's going to be the best. It is very common for businesses and organizations to actually adopt more than one framework. And so if you look at some of the leaders in sustainability, um, you'll and look at their, their um, actual reports that they put out, you'll see a combination of factors. Um, and that's okay, that's okay. There are advantages in, you know, of, of these different frameworks and, um, uh, companies and organizations that have a very sophisticated sustainability and ESG program, they kind of pick and pull from different frameworks. Strong programs, competitive advantage. Um, you're going to see, um, you know, more and more uh, uh, coalescing, consolidation of frameworks. Um, adopt a framework that's built off of, you know, your audience, um, share, shareholders, stakeholders want transparency, they want accountability, um, and reporting is really one of the key ways in order to communicate with 
all stakeholders what your organization and business is, is doing on this, this front. Um, the last state, you know, the last point of this, um, just very quickly, um, the SEC is coming out in the next few months in the United States here with um, some pretty strong um, disclosure requirements around climate. It's, uh, and it does include scope three, um, and that's going to have a pretty big impact here in the United States. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to go through very quickly this last section about trends and pitfalls and next steps. So some trends to watch for in 2023. Again, this is very overwhelming. What are some of the key um, topics in the E and in the S and in the G? Um, carbon net zero, right? If you're following key topics in the business world, you see all of the announcements by companies to go net zero. That's a big deal, right? And you're gonna see an increasing number of companies making net zero commitments, um, not only making the commitment, but then on top of it too, trying to provide a timeline, 2030, 2040, 2050, you see a variety of these commitments being made. And then of course, there's gonna have to be the hustle around actually being able to meet that. And then in the interim, reporting on their progress. So a um, uh, key trend for the S is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Absolutely. And then the kind of the key trend with respect to the G is accountability. Um, accountability is best achieved, of course, through that reporting and openness of what you're doing, what you're not doing, areas of strengths, areas of weaknesses, and how you're then going about achieving um, you know, improvements within your business too. Again, accountability, I'd say a close second, if not some of a competing factor in the G um, has to do with board diversity. Um, you know, that is also kind of a component, of course, of, of DEI, but lots of discussions around the world about um, board diversity. Here, I mentioned a few of those, the DEI trend within the S and then the governance, the accountability is the new transparency. It's just incredibly important, right? Common pitfalls, very, you know, very, you know, briefly, you know, it's organizations now are moving from that. I have to do ESG and sustainability because it's a risk mitigation strategy. We've got to do this to now they're starting to recognize that implementing longer term um, ESG sustainability strategies actually go to corporate purpose. Um, there are some you know, pitfalls. You see the ESG ratings, communications, inconsistencies, those types of things. Um, you hear, of course, so much about greenwashing. Um, but, um, and so it's important that companies, if you're, if you're going to do it, and obviously there's the business imperative now to do this, um, that you do it, that you do it right. And you, you recognize that there are these pitfalls and put mitigation in, in place to try to avoid as much as you can some of those common pitfalls. So here are some ways that I, I highlight you can avoid those pitfalls, um, you know, monitoring, assessments, um, communications are, are key. Um, you know, having the board of directors being in, intimately involved in your ESG strategies, um, putting together, you know, the structures in place within your organization for monitoring and assessment. You see a big push right now, um, sustainability as a service. Um, you see software being built um, increasingly, just like you've got accounting software that there's gonna be, there's ESG software that more and more companies are purchasing in order to build the monitoring and, you know, with, you know, ongoing monitoring into their business processes. I kind of work with organizations. I've got a seven step process that I work with as I uh, help management and boards adopt ESG. Um, that one of the questions I get is, oh my goodness, where do I begin, right? Um, this is so overwhelming. This is a business transformation. Um, it's a new way of looking at business, right? It's a shift from your, stakeholder, your, your shareholder to your stakeholder capitalism. So as I work with clients, I kind of have this process that I bring people through to actually build out a strategy 
after we talk about risk mitigation, all right, then how do we actually build a long-term value creation strategy? My roadmap that um, I use, again, I'm happy um, at a later point to speak with anybody more about this roadmap that um, I work with. And some final, you know, kind of, you know, key takeaways from, you know, this, to, this end discussion. Um, start small, the trends in ESG, net zero, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accountability. Those are really, really key. Thank you. It, I hope that these slides have been helpful. Um, I look forward to now having some time here um, for Q&A before we wrap up um, our time together today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Faust. This was, uh, why, this was a very tightly held uh, uh, presentation and to the point and uh, covered quite a variety and quite a spectrum of, uh, uh, of concepts here. So thank you so much for that lecture. You're welcome. Uh, so if I may ask um, if there are any other questions, kindly do send it on. So we have one from, I believe from Mark Davis, thinking ahead, uh, what is the future of 2023 ESG trends reporting and investing in 10 years? What will be Faust Global's focus during this rapid change? How will our world shift by 20? 33. Wow. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So great. Thank you, Mark, very much for um, those questions. So, you know, in the next 10 years, I think you're going to just continue to see the rapid adoption of ESG and sustainability into business. Um, and, you know, one of the things that one of the trends that I'm, I'm very focused on in my client work is, you um, addressing what I think is going to be a very urgent need by your small and your medium-sized businesses to adopt ESG and sustainability into their, their business um, model. The public, the large public companies, um, understandably so, have been the first to move into this space for a number of reasons. Um, and now all of this increased regulation that has come but is, is dramatically increasing in the next 12 to 18 months, um, you're seeing these larger public companies, you know, um, scrambling. Um, they are building out significant ESG um, kind of departments within their companies. They're hiring all big consultants and Bain and McKenzie and, and trying to very rapidly do this. Um, and as they're forced to disclose in the next couple of years, their impact on the environment, in particular on climate, the reality is it's going to flow down and impact your small and medium-sized vendors and people that, that fill into it, right? That's the scope three um, that I think the business community um, is a little concerned about, right? How are we going to actually do this? And so what I'm hearing um, from the marketplace um, almost every day when I get more of your small and medium-sized businesses reaching out to me um, is we're seeing from our customers that are your Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 companies that they're just going to push this stuff down on us, right, um, in order to comply with the disclosures that are coming for them. Um, they're just going to ask us to fill out the forms on three and ultimately push it up um, to them. And so a trend I think is you're gonna, you're gonna see your small and medium sized businesses scrambling. I think that they of course lack your time, money and resources you know, in order to adopt, you know, to adapt and adopt this increased regulation that they're forced to deal with. Um, I think you're gonna see an increase in services around ESG and sustainability consultancies now, even smaller consultancies are building out ESG departments. Um, again, you're seeing software being built and helping to automate this. Um, you know, it's, it is a rapid change from having a shareholder mind frame to a stakeholder mind frame. So my focus as a business um, for many reasons is to try to help that small and medium size um, company um, build out sustainability and ESG strategies. Not only because I see there's a business opportunity that there, it's a, it's a business imperative, 
but also just because of my personal beliefs that sustainability isn't going to become truly widespread until small and medium-sized businesses adopt this, right? Small and medium-sized businesses are the engine of any economy, right? Most people work for small and medium-sized businesses. They do not work for the large publicly listed company. So um, if you believe in this, which I do, um, I really want it to become widespread throughout um, the business community and all different levels. I hope that's answered your, your question. I have right. a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Siddharth, yeah. Yes. So since ESG seems to be a voluntary uh, submission right now, is it in any way connected with the various uh, nationally determined commitments, the NDCs, that every government has pledged during these COP events? I mean, is there, is there a way that the regulatory and the uh, voluntary can match? Right. You know, I think that, I think you're gonna see some coordination and collaboration um, kind of between that. I think, um, you know, you probably, you know, the effectiveness of, you know, events like COP can be controversial, right? It seems like there often is an enormous amount of talk and very little action um, when you get organizations and so many countries and so many things, right, trying to all get in a room and agree on certain things. Um, I think that there will be um, some connectedness. Um, I think it will probably be small, though, in a, in a smaller um, way. Um, I think you're going to get blocks. Obviously, Europe is working, you know, um, they're working across the European Union, for example, to, you know, create an enormous amount of regulation. Um, the U.S. in the past few years has dramatically increased their efforts in this space. Um, and I think companies are going to certainly lobby both federal, you know, governments um, all federal governments, um, I think, to try to have some collaboration on this on this fact. So, just as an example, the um, the European Union has come up with a pretty extensive new regulation around um, sustainability disclosures, and it will first and foremost this year impact larger publicly listed companies within the European Union, however, of a certain size and scale. However, what they also are going to do is even if you're not headquartered in the Europe in, in, in Europe, if you have and they've some parameters, significant operations in Europe, um, you too are going are going to have to comply with those regulations, right? It's very similar to the tax structure. That's how I tell people to look at this, right? You know, I could be an American living in France. Um, and you know, I have to consider paying taxes in France. And if I make a certain money still as a US citizen, I still have to pay some taxes back in the United States. Um, those types of things are very complicated and um, businesses are now gonna have to very similarly do the same regardless of where they're headquartered. And so I think in things like that, the practical implication of regulations will push businesses to lobby their governments um, and certainly push you know, the, the UN and other organizations to try to harmonize. But, um, it's going to be lopsided and clumsy, I think, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. That that's a fairly candid uh, admission of where the things might stand, or by the way, the things might turn out. Uh, but if I may have a follow up question, if there is no one else asking any other questions, so, there is, there is one yes, more question. yes, yes, please, yes. <laughs> so it's on the chat. It's by Sukumar. Can you please read it? I am yes. unable to see it. How, how to counter the MNCs, which are heavily generating fossil fuels and causing a lot of problems to climate. How to build eco-friendly firms um, in the given situation. Yes, right. There's an enormous amount of debate about this um, or banks, right, that, you know, support fossil fuel companies and at the same time are, are backing renewable companies. Um, uh, you know, it's ultimately, you know, I think when it comes, how do you build eco-friendly firms, right? Um, I think the biggest incentive is, 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 is backed by the investors, it's backed by money. And so what I mean by that is, um, 
I don't think you can, it's going to be more challenging to build eco-friendly firms and less investors, right? People that hold the purse strings are pushing uh, companies in this direction um, and less companies see the business imperative that's there. And so, um, you know, I look at this, I say it's a top down and a bottom up. So from a top-down perspective, investors, if you are an invest, you know, if you're an investor, whether it's, you know, a, as a high net worth individual or a family, family office, or if you're an institutional investor, you work at a bank or all these others, you know, you hold the power of the purse. And I encourage you to make your asset allocations with eco-friendly sustainability in mind. Um, you know, I think it's ultimately businesses will start to move in a direction of money. I see more and more banks, for example, providing, um, I like to call it nudge financing. So you're seeing, uh, you're seeing banks provide different loan structures based upon sustainability targets. So if you're a company, you might get a reduced interest rate for your loan, right? You meet certain milestones and targets. And so those are those nudging mechanisms that you can do. It's a little bit softer than directly tying things. Um, so I see that from a top-down perspective. From a bottom-up perspective, um, how you build eco-friendly firms is when, when businesses see that there is a market for, um, you know, when, when businesses see that there's a market for sustainable eco-friendly products and services, right? So as a consumer, um, I encourage each one of us to do our part. Um, and to encourage businesses and um, organizations to see that there's a demand for eco-friendly and sustainable products and services. So it's how you shop, that we walk, we not only talk the talk, but that we walk the walk. And, um, and I think those kind of pressures from the top down from investors and then the bottom up helping to create more of a market. Um, my hope is that businesses will start building sustainability more and more into their processes and into their purpose because it, it, there's an advantage to it, a competitive advantage to it. So I hope that answers your question and is helpful. Yes, um, uh, thank you. So this is Kanan, I have one question, right? Um, uh, so this is, uh, so uh, I mean, ESG investing is an opportunity to the banks, right? Currently, as you said, there is a transformational journey for all the firms, right? And the banks are funding it, right? Uh, with, with your experience of working with the clients, have you sized up the, the market potential for banks available today in terms of uh, the ESG investments? Because uh, though we call it as sustainable financing, I think uh, the, uh, I, I'll call it as targeted financing towards, you know, um, with, with the goal to achieve profitability as well. So ha have, you, have, you, have you been able to see what is that market like for banks? Right, right. You know, I think, I think, um, you know, it's a growing market. Um, I think one of the challenges, right, is because there are so many, it's defining the market, right? So there are so many different terms that are out there. Um, and, and, you know, and so many different definitions individually of, of what it means, you know, what is impact or ESG investing or, um, uh, you know, I hear, I, I like one group I know out in California, they, when bank, they kind of call it world positive investing. I like that. Um, you know, I hear people, CalPERS, the big institution out um, in California as well, one of the largest public pensions in the United States. Now they're calling it new generation investing um, next generation investing, you know, everybody is kind of building their own definition of what this general type of investing is called based upon what's most meaningful for them. And so when you say, what's the market, it's so hard to get your arms around it. I mean, there are organizations that, you know, put a size and scale to the market and it's significant. I mean, over the past couple of years, the demand for products in the ESG and the sustainability space, right, whatever you want to term it, has grown exponentially. Um, and it's because of that demand, of course, that you're seeing just so many different new ESG funds. 
um, you know, all the things that they're, the, the products that are, are coming, you know, uh, to it. Um, and so it's about, I think, putting together for your particular bank, you know, a strategy that's mean, meaningful, you know, to you. Um, and that's where, unfortunately, there isn't an easy one size fits all, you know, ESG or sustainability strategy. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, you know, it's interesting. People, people will call me and they'll say, I'm really confused about all this stuff. And um, uh, I really don't know where to start. And even people, very educated, experienced, big companies, big investment firms. And um, if you're confused, I, I always try to tell people you're not alone. <laughs> Everybody somewhat is. Um, you know, it is just such a new emerging in, uh, field and they're still working the kinks out of it all. Um, and I think that's why you hear so much about greenwashing, right? Um, greenwashing, social washing, I hear red washing, I hear all sorts of washing terms. And it's because the market right now, as, as we sit in it, is really just being defined um, as we go about. So happy to have other two offline conversations, individual ones, and perhaps I can give you a more tailored answer once I too kind of maybe better understand as well your particular bank or, or case, so. Sure, thank you, thanks, Jennifer. Sure. So if there are no further questions, and in fact, we have hit past the uh, time limit as well. So um, thank you everybody for joining and thank you especially to Ms. Faust for a very enlightening and illuminating session and for having the patience to answer uh, our questions as well. So thank you so much for the time that you have uh, given us on this uh, on the weekend here. And thank you everybody for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, next weekend, we'll have another set of webinars and uh, we will keep everyone posted about the developments on that front as the week progresses. Uh, thank you so much again. Thank you. Good yes. day to everybody. Good day to everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Yes. Bye -bye. Thank you all, everybody.